So welcome everyone to another Zoom session of the Ottawa Insight Meditation Community. And we just practiced a couple of different concentration practices um, in that uh, sitting. Uh, we we practiced where we you know concentration practice where we pick one object and just and focus our attention right in on that object and if anything distracts us interferes with our focus on that object we simply once we notice we bring our attention back to that that focus and that object and that's probably many many of you are probably familiar with that um concentration practice in fact often we start our sittings with that kind of practice um, in a way to allow uh, the, the body um, mind uh, complex to to settle if that's what's available in those in that moment and then we we also did a, a what's called momentary concentration where we uh, loud the the breath was still there, but if something else came and captured our attention and uh, another object appeared, we used that as our new focus of uh, attention, and the breath went into the background. I sometimes call this foreground background, <laughs> and then once that whatever that it might be, might have been a bird chirping captured your attention, you bring your awareness to the bird chirping and then once it you know, the mind's no longer interested there's no there's no uh, it's not grabbing your attention you come back to the breath um, and you kind of just go back and forth and if there's nothing else coming into awareness that's um, then you, you just simply stay on the breath um, and so it's more of a flexible um, concentration practice and I'll talk about um, sort of another one as well in this um, in this uh, talk so today we're we're still on the the seven factors of awakening and uh, this is uh, the sixth factor called concentration and we also the we're gonna re really briefly talk about the fifth factor which is um, calm. So we went from mindfulness, the first factor, and investigation, second factor, to uh, energy and effort, which is the third factor, to uh, rapture or joy, which is the fourth factor, and then calm and concentration being the fifth and sixth uh, factors. And then, of course, next session will be the seventh factor, which is equanimity. So calm is uh, pasadi. Sometimes it's called tranquility, serenity. It's kind of a soothing factor that arises that quiets um, disturbances. Uh, it's a quality of mind that feels kind of like a cooling. Maybe that metaphor works. A cooling of the desiring mind. So the hindrances, those kind of those five hindrances that we, we speak about in this practice um, start to fall away. There's a cooling of the mind, a settling into the moment. Um, and we can notice when it when it arises. We spoke about this with um, PT or, or a rapture. Part of the practice is noticing when it arises. It's the same with this calm factor. So it's not something we're constructing. It's something we're noticing when it, um, when it shows itself. And then concentration, of course, in Pali is samadhi. It's the mind that's unified or gathered in this um, undistracted uh, state. So it's a gathering of the mind. You can kind of look at it as uh, like herding sheep. <laughs> the sheep are, are, are gathered into a, a herd. They're not kind of running away, running all over the place. They're, they're gathered 
or, or another way you could look at it is a kind of a uni unified mind. It's mind and the body are unified and um, there's a, a, a quiet that permeates. It's unified and collected, gathered. Now, a common misconception is that what concentration practice is, is uh, bringing a scattered mind under control. Um, that that's, and you can kind of see where that conception comes from, and, because we're talking about gathering the mind, unifying the mind. But in a, what, it's not a, it's not a control. It's not you controlling as much. It, 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 what it is is allowing things to to settle. And I'll talk more about what I mean by that. You, there's conditions that we can create whereby the mind um, is more likely to settle. Uh, one thing I noticed in the uh, a place where I, I did some practice was uh, Lao or Laos as we sometimes call it and um, it's, it's a Theravadan Buddhist country, very devout um, country, the monks still doing alms rounds <laughs> in the streets. And they, <clears throat> they, they, they start with sila, or ethical behavior. So if you, and in fact, even if you say you're an experienced meditator and you go talk to a teacher, <laughs> they'll start with, with sila, or ethical behavior. Um, and they'll move on to generosity <clears throat> and those other those other wholesome factors of mind before they talk about concentration practice or mindfulness practice. And what they're doing is they're creating the conditions for concentrated mind. Right? As if you're living ethically, it's a kind of the, sometimes I've heard the phrase, the bliss of blamelessness. <laughs> you know, there's, if you're, if you're not, uh, if you're leading, leading an ethical life, it's less likely for these disturbances to come up in your practice that, that scatter the mind. You know, like worry about something that you did, some anxiety around um, uh, unethical or unwholesome actions, deeds, uh, thoughts, speech. So that's what I mean by, you know, kind of creating the conditions. Simple life is another one, uh, simplifying our lives is another one that can be conducive to a gathering or collecting of the mind. I mean, that, and that doesn't mean, you know, you, you have to, just to sell everything. You know, I was surprised to hear Elon Musk is selling all his houses, <laughs> like nine of them or something, and he's one of 30 million house here. He's, and are you saying he wants to, he wants to simplify his life? I don't quite know why, but um, it, you know, there could be an aspect of trying to collect or gather his mind so he can focus. So it's not about trying to control the mind. That you, that's a losing battle. If you come into this practice thinking, I need to control thoughts in order to concentrate the mind. You're setting yourself up for, for some pain, <laughs> for, for some suffering, because um, you're resisting thoughts. And what we resist, as soon as there's aversion, it's feeding it, it's giving its juice. What we resist persists, as the saying goes. So there needs to be that lightness of touch, that uh, non-striving approach to allowing the mind to settle. Uh, my approach, and I'll, before I, I'll go into sort, sort of the sort of the, the other um, ways to conceive of this, but my approach is that stillness is already there, and you probably perhaps saw this in my the way I offered the natural awareness meditations, that stillness is always there. It's simply obscured. Um, it's not something we go out and create or get. 
uh, by controlling our experience. We simply look and see that behind all the activity and movement, that there is stillness, there's quiet, there's peace, there's this quiet. It's behind and within all, all the movement. And there's this stillness. It's kind of the analogy that it was is meaningful for me is it's kind of like the ocean. <clears throat> the depth of the ocean is still, well, stiller than the than the surface. Uh, the surface can be very wavy, but there's a, a certain stillness that's present underneath that in the ocean. But we're usually focused on the waves. So the, the ocean also has the nature of stillness, not just the nature of waves and all that motion that's on the surface. There's also it also has the nature of of stillness. If that metaphor is helpful for you to point to the fact that the stillness is always there. So the um, the, the, the Buddha actually, <clears throat> just to bring the Buddha into this, you don't necessarily have to, to do these practices, of course, but um, I find his very systematic teachings helpful uh, in, in learning this practice. He actually sought out, uh, you know, when he saw, started this practice, he sought out teachers and his first two teachers were a, a concentration teachers. And he uh, practiced with them, had two, uh, two su successive teachers, and came out uh, and said that this teaching does not lead to peace, to nibbana, to, um, uh, to awakening, but only to a base consisting of nothingness. Only, can, only um, to a base consisting of nothingness. So we're not trying to, this practice is about seeing things as they are. It's not about trying to blank out the mind and trying to reach an altered state for the, for the um, purposes of living in an altered state <laughs> to escape a life. <laughs> how, how, how would we possibly understand the true nature of phenomenon and, and us if we're escaping from it by blanking out the mind. So the Buddha said this is, um, uh, he was asking a different question and the exclusive emphasis on um, concentration wasn't answering this, this, his question. So he went in the other direction and went to aesthetic practices. <laughs> And found those, you know, where you, you, you don't eat, you don't, there's, you completely shut all the sense doors uh, down. <clears throat> and you found that didn't work either. And kind of, of course, uh, had a more of a middle um, way through this middle path. So then he began to understand how concentration could be used in the service of insight and awakening, that um, concentration is useful on the path to freedom, but it's not freedom itself. There's a place for it, but it's not the goal. And there are some types of meditation where uh, it is the goal, uh, uh, perhaps transcendental meditation, some types where you know, just simply, you know, this kind of bliss uh, is is the goal. Uh, of course, in insight meditation, that's uh, not the case. It's uh, the, the goal is is quite different. So the Buddha really emphasized the fact that you need the concentration practices uh, for wisdom, but you also need wisdom for the concentration practices. Um, you need both. It 
So <clears throat> the um, I've been told that the the word samadhi is actually mentioned more times in this Pali Canon suttas than the word mindfulness or sati, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, it's uh, mentioned in so many of his um, schematas or fr frameworks lists <laughs> for practice. It's, um, it's the last step of the eightfold path, which is part of the Four Noble Truths. It's the, uh, the sixth factor in the um, seven factors of awakening. It's, it's one of the five spiritual faculties, one of the five spiritual powers. So sometimes they say there's 37 principles of awakening. You know, that's basically all these different lists that add up to 37. Um, four of those are concentration. So it's, it's, it's prominent in, 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 um, in, the, in the Buddha's teachings, very prominent. And in fact, you, you could say it's, it's, it, it's been a bit neglected perhaps in the West, even though it is quite prominent in the teachings. The West in terms of, um, you know, what Western Dharma teachings around insight meditation. There aren't a lot of um, insight meditation teachers that put a, a big emphasis on concentration practice. I've practiced with one in particular uh, who I'll talk about, but um, not, there's not a, a, not a big emphasis. And the way it's often discussed is uh, it allows us uh, to, it kind of magnifies or uh, uh, gives us a, a clearer view of the way things are. So we, it magnifies so we can see things clear, more clearly, kind of think of it as a camera zooming in on, on, a, on what's occurring, what's arising and really being able to get closer and see more details. So it's kind of gives us that kind of laser focus or magnified um, view of what's arising. Now we've all had um, experiences of the mind being concentrated at one time or another. Um, sometimes it happens when we first start our practice. For me personally, I, I took a first year course uh, in university in the late 70s, and uh, it was a course on the Bhagavad Gita, which is, uh, the, is a, a Hindu um, teaching. Uh, and the teacher uh, offered us uh, meditation and he offered us the third eye meditation, which is what they practice where you simply bring your focus of attention to the middle of your forehead as the divine eye, the third eye. And you just, if your mind wanders, you bring it back to that. So it's the same kind of thing, only it's the center of your forehead as opposed to the tip of your nose or your, or your belly. And here I was a young university student and, and boom, I, I went into this deep, deep state of concentration and thought uh, I had tasted freedom right away. <laughs> like it was just this sort of sudden um, a sense of, uh, of rapture and calm and, and, and so on. And um, I actually for a while took it as freedom because and I wanted it back real bad, right? Of course, I started chasing it and then it became elusive. But the point of the, 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 the story is, is that this can come at unexpected times, this, this kind of calm. Um, and for me, there was, it, it, you know, it just arose kind of um, uh, quite quickly and easily. And for others, it's, it can be quite different. So, I want to raise the sort of the question that comes up most often around this is how much concentration is necessary for insight practice, for insight meditation? How much concentration 
do we need in order to see things as they are and to understand um, the true our true nature, the true nature of reality, you know, to see the those inside impermanence, selflessness, dukkha or suffering, and so forth. Now there's a very a, a, a very a wide variety of views on this um, from from different teachers. So you know, I'll, I'll kind of boil it down to some of the monks that speak about it that then influence the lay teachers. So Paak Sayadaw, who you might have heard of, he's te- taught at Insight Meditation Society, recommends jhanic levels of concentration or very, very deep levels of concentration. I'll talk about the jhanas in a minute. Um, couldn't have the time. Uh, in order to get into insight, the mind has to be very, very concentrated and you, you would sit for um, lengthy periods of time to concentrate the mind in order to do this. Somebody like Mahasi Sayadaw, who had a huge influence on the Western, early Western teachers, didn't speak about that at all. He just spoke about, you know, access concentration or momentary concentration. It's that basic level before the jhanas, before the first jhana. Basic level of, and that's what I was pointing to with that momentary awareness, being aware of whatever arises and focusing your attention on that. And then when it fades back to the breath, a new object arises, it's kind of moment by moment, a momentary concentration. And then you have somebody like Saidao Tanjaniya, who's very influential right now with so many teachers, like currently, um, doesn't talk about concentration much at all. He emphasizes mindfulness, continuous mindfulness. Um, that, that, would, that would be his, in a relaxed kind of approach uh, to it. So you can see the, the varying views. Now I won't go into how all this comes about because believe it or not, it's a, you know, human organizations, <laughs> Asian countries form really religious organizations and lo and behold, there's politics. So there are actually politics around, you know, how much concentration is, is uh, needed for this practice. And we won't get into all that. I, I like to keep it fairly practical for our purposes. Um, I would say, I would put it this way. Um, you need the, the amount of concentration necessary to see things as they are. Um, and perhaps concentration is a weak link in, in the West. Like not, a lot, not a lot of us are practicing it, so it's something to explore. And it, and it, and it can be developed with practice. So that's the, the uh, good news. So I would say um, there's, it, you could look at it two ways. If you're naturally inclined towards deep concentration, you may be inclined to really practice that quite a bit, right? Because it's, it's, it comes easily and you could easily fall into deep levels of concentration. For those folks, I might say, ah, oh, you maybe you should put some little more emphasis on the insight, <laughs> on the, sorry, the mindfulness side of the equation, the tangenia, re, re, about the relaxing into the approach, relaxing into the meditation. If you're the type who, who just, the mind's just going, 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 you go, oh, this concentration's, I, this is not something uh, that's for me. I can't do it. It's, it's not. Then I invite you to explore a little more the concentration practices. So in other words, don't go to what's easy. Play around with what might be um, challenging in your practice, because we can kind of default to what's easy and then not, uh, grow and progress in our practice. And I say this to you because I spent years doing concentration practice because it was easy, got nowhere because I was just, I was, well, I shouldn't say nowhere. It allowed me to get through some pretty stressful periods in my life, you know, university. <laughs> and then I worked overseas and as a human rights worker, you know, 
very dangerous situation and it was it was it allowed me i could just go back and i could just escape from all of that go into this calm blissful state and feel quite refreshed after um but i wasn't the in, there was no insight practice it was simply a um, like medication <laughs> more like medication than uh, insight meditation um but it came easily. Uh, so I, it wasn't until I started to challenge myself to really let go of that and practice more, um, really emphasize the mindfulness side of it, that uh, other questions arose and, and other um, knowings, uh, understandings arose. So I would uh, <clears throat> like to, I guess, share three ways that um, insight or concentration is talked about. And uh, one is the, that one-pointed or focused concentration where that we practice with the breath. And, um, the Buddha talked about 40 different objects that could be used. We tend to use the breath, but it, it could be other, um, other objects where you, you just continually focus on that one object, distraction arises, you come back to that one object. And this is what would be involved in jhana practices. You just get absorbed into that object uh, exclusively. And um, Lee Brasington, he's the teacher that I uh, did my jhana practice with more recently in the, like about 2005 in that area. I did a 10 day jhana retreat with Lee Brasington. And he says, the jhanas are eight altered states of consciousness brought on by a concentration, each yielding more concentration than the previous. As you pass through the jhanas, you stair-step your way to deeper and deeper levels of concentration. That is, you become less and less likely to become distracted. So there are eight altered states of consciousness. So they're they're conditioned, they're constructed states, um, impermanent states. And they get deeper and deeper as you go through the, the different jhanas. So that's what fixed, fixed, one-pointed concentration is about. It's about the jhanas and, and becoming deep, more and more concentrated. And the idea is you move into insight practice as you become more and more concentrated. The other is flexible or open concentration. And that's where you're practicing insight meditation and, until you, you're, sorry, you, you, you practice concentration until you reach enough concentration or to, to, to be aware of what's arising, sort of momentary concentration. So you're not, you're not just sitting there and thinking and and following thought trains, you're actually bringing your attention back to what's arising. Ah, there's thinking. There's sounds. Uh, and you're, you, you're, you bring that bare attention to whatever arises to awareness. It's seen. And then it fades. You might go back to the breath at that point, And then something else uh, rises into awareness. So the mind can be present with changing objects. This is a key. With fixed, it's present with one object. You can see the changing nature of that one object because the breath's constantly changing. So you can see impermanence. With flexible or open concentration, you're present with changing objects. So different objects, sounds, 
smells, tastes, if that comes up while you're meditating, thoughts, emotions, in a constant way. So it's a constant uh, um, uh, attention to those objects. So then the mind can investigate, uh, you know, the three characteristics, um, understand the nature of what's, what's arising. So you're present with the flow of experience with this open concentration, uh, aiming and sustaining with whatever arises. And when the mind, if you get, you know, distracted by thought, you just notice that you're caught in a thought train, you come back to that, uh, uh, you know, up to awareness, to a focus on changing objects. Um, yeah. You, you see that practice sometimes when people talk about maintaining an anchor, the breath as an anchor, something else arises, bring your attention to that, and then you come back to the breath as an anchor. I like that term anchor. It's kind of like the, the boat is anchored <laughs> and then stuff's all happening around the boat. <clears throat> if, if boat metaphors help. So the boat's not just being bounced around by waves, but it's, it's anchored. Um, uh, so that's, that's, you know, the, how Mahasi Sayadaw and many inside meditation teachers teach now is this notion of an anchor and then this open, flexible awareness. And attuned to change, noticing change. Um, natural awareness would be the third. So you've got fixed, one-pointed, open, more flexible, and then um, natural awareness. So with natural, and this would be people like, oh, my teacher, Matthew Flickstein, um, Ajashanti, um, to a degree, Utanjaniya would teach this way as well. Um, Ajahn Chah, at times, the Thai forest master taught this way in his lifetime. Um, yeah, he, uh, he would say, you know, you don't need deep absorption, deep, deep concentration to practice mindfulness. It's just Settle in and focus on on on, on awareness, and this is what we you know when we did that natural awareness meditation. What what we did was we would feel the breath, and then we would feel the stillness around the breath, and and bring our attention to that stillness, to that context within which all the content is happening. So it's kind of resting attention on awareness itself. Effortless awareness, um, non-doing, it's, it's really letting go of any sense of controlling experience. You're simply resting in awareness and letting whatever arises to arise. No, there's no sense of control at all. No, no struggle with what is. And of course, I've had I've been influenced by all three of those teachers. So this is where I what I I I, I practice myself, um, for the most part. Although I must say, this week I played around with one pointed concentration just for the purposes of this uh, of this talk and found it very interesting to return to that practice and to see what uh, what came up um, so the the practice of um, concentrating on stillness itself or resting in awareness 
is really deepening our experience of anatta or selflessness. That there's no one in control of, of this, that the whole mind body process complex is simply empty phenomenon rising and falling. And that the, it, within that awareness, that stillness. So, I mean, you've, you've practiced, you know, if you've been coming to these sessions, for, so we've practiced all these, all three of these actually in, in, in some manner in the, in the last, um, you know, since the Zoom session started, I don't know, was that, how many are we at, like 10 Zoom sessions or something at this point, <laughs> getting up there anyway. Um, so you've, you've practiced all of those. And you know what, see what resonates. See what resonates with your practice. And, but I invite you to sort of play around with some of the, um, the, the variety, the, the three. And I, I, I might say too that when you sit down to practice, be very clear on which one you're going to practice. So you're not like, oh, I'm going to do uh, one focused meditation, you know, one pointed, I'm going to follow the breath. That's my practice. And you sit down and you go, Oh, this isn't working. I'm going to try that open, flexible meditation. Uh, oh, this isn't working either. I'm going to try the, well, maybe I'll go back to the one point. You know, just say for this practice, this, this sitting, I'm going to do one pointed. I'm going to do um, flexible or you know, pick one of them and, and finish that, finish the practice. Um, and then watch for those judgments. I mean, what, what, what makes it not working? <laughs> I always find that funny. Well, it's not working. Um, <clears throat> what does that mean? <laughs> it means challenges came up, which is the juice of this practice. Right? Um, anyway, I won't go into that here. Um, if lots of thoughts arise, which is often what people what caused people to say it's not working or it's not a great meditation, I invite you to look at your attitude towards this. Yeah, the emphasis is on knowing the mind. So just be aware of it when, when thoughts come up, aware that the mind is thinking. If you feel that this is a problem, then the problems with your attitude not with the mind thinking. So the minds do that. So the wandering mind's not a problem. It's your your attitude that this shouldn't happen. That's the problem. So just acknowledge thinking whenever it occurs. It's just, that's what's arising. And of course, if you're newer to meditation or, or brand new, then you might find that you constantly get lost in thought. Um, and when you, when you realize that you're thinking, just pay attention to the thought first, just as a thought, not, not your thought, not um, necessarily a true thought, and then return either to your object of attention or to um, resting in awareness. Yeah. I'll stop there and uh, open it up for any questions or comments. So how does this compare to Vipassana? So I ask because I've had two attempts with Vipassana. The first was, I would say, very good. The second was less so. And I'm wondering if it's because I had been mixing in more insight meditation with it. So I found it a struggle and there was so much I think anger that came up with regards to trying to stay focused on the sensations of the body. 
So I guess my, yeah, my question is how does Vipassana mix in with what you've been suggesting here today? <clears throat> so Vipassana and insight meditation are the same thing. Me. Yeah. It's uh, there's no difference. Um, so yeah, that to, to sort of answer that part of it. Now, um, it doesn't mean everybody's teaching the same thing that <laughs> teaches Vipassana and insight meditation. SN Goenko um, teaches quite a different type of Vipassana than you might find at Insight Meditation Society. Uh, uh. There's just different different approaches. And, and, you know, that's partly why I gave you kind of that overview of all the different ways that we can talk about concentration so that you might not, so there's less confusion when you hear all these different things. Ultimately, you do what resonates for you in your practice. But notice what, you notice the judging mind. When the mind says this isn't working or anger arises over something a teacher's saying, I look deeply Personally, I look very deeply at that, at those moments when a teacher set of insight meditation a teacher says something that causes anger to arise. Wow, I got a real, this is something that needs investigating. Or if a re whole retreat <laughs> brings up some, some anger, then it's something to, it's really something to look at. Uh, can you look at it as an, an opportunity to bring mindfulness to that? right to that not every teacher is going to resonate with us and so i mean that that's important too but the you know there's something we can learn from every um well every teacher i've had even though it may not be exactly what i thought it would be <laughs> coming into it i've managed to to learn something and, and find uh often some deep profound um, um, teachings uh, within that but yeah so the Vipassana insight meditation um, the same thing and concentration practice is very much a part of those of, of that of Vipassana mm. yeah. I mean Vipassana just means see, deeply seeing <laughs> insight meditation so it's, it's the idea of, of seeing what's true um, is the point of, of the practice, right? It's so, yeah. Sorry, um, I'm having a little trouble getting my head around uh, ex noticing a thought versus thinking. <clears throat> yeah, that's um, that's a key a key element of this practice. It's, it's a very, it sounds like a very simple question, but it's a very profound question. Uh, it's kind of gets at the crux of what we say, mean when we say uh, noticing X, Y, Z, <laughs> being aware of whatever it is. Uh, it's, so we're not chasing after objects. We're simply being aware of whatever arises. Now, thinking arises, we're not chasing after the thoughts, right? Or a sound arises, we're not chasing after the sound. So a bird chirps, we're not going, oh, I wonder what other birds are out there that are chirping and start identifying the birds, okay? Or a thought, arises about 
the fact that you're running out of food and you need to go to Costco. <laughs> that which brings up anxiety <laughs> in today's climate. Um, you don't start thinking, oh, do I have a mask? Do I have, you know, hand wipes, the gloves, whatever you might do. I have, you know, and when am I, what's the best time to go? Should I go during the senior hour? Should I go to, you know, and then you just go, oh, there's a thought, a planning thought arising. You notice it. As soon as you notice it, it's, it, it fades. It may come up again. You notice it, it fades. Thing is, you can't hold the thinking process in consciousness and think at the same time. So as soon as you're aware that thinking is occurring, you're no longer thinking. Have you ever noticed that when you're meditating? As soon as you become aware that thinking is occurring, you're no longer thinking. Now thinking might start up again. Then you notice that thinking is occurring again. You know, you're no longer thinking at that point. Because you can't, you can't think and be aware of thinking at the same time. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> Consciousness can only hold one thing at a time. So as soon as you notice thinking, now of course you get lost in thought. Right? That's where you follow. So you, 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 you forget to be mindful. You forget to be aware and you just start thinking. Well, at some point, something arises where you become aware that you're lost in thought. You don't do anything. It just happens. It could be in two minutes. It could be in half an hour. It could be when the bell goes. <laughs> uh, as soon as you become aware that you're lost in thought, now you're aware of thinking again. The thinking will stop. It will dissolve. So really, that's, that's it. That's, I mean, that's really the practice. You're simply being aware that thinking has arisen. Are people getting that? It's so important. I hope, uh, hope I'm being clear with that point. You can't be aware of thinking and thinking occur at the same time. So you can't be thinking about Costco and be aware that that planning thought has arisen at the same time. Try it. You have to leave awareness to start thinking again. <laughs> you have to drop the awareness part of it. It's it's uh, worth it's it's something it's really worth exploring that and 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 really seeing that 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 the nature of, of awareness in that regard. Well, yes. Um, however, uh, I'm sure I'm not unique in this, um, and I really do want to understand. Uh, get this I mean I get it cognitively but experientially is another thing so you know the mind um, is is pretty cr tricky and real good at that thinking right very 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 good at it so okay if I say oh look I'm thinking I've noticed my thought I need to go to Costco um, then thinking about thinking so i've noticed all right oh i'm thinking i'm going to costco oh yeah i caught my thought um isn't that another thought oh look how i'm now thinking about how i caught my thought like <clears throat> The first thing you said was awareness. The second thing you said, oh, look, aren't I good? I was aware of my thought. 
that's another thought. Yeah. So now you're just aware of another thought. Oh, aren't I good is simply another thought. As soon as you're aware of that, it's done. It dissolves. Right? It's, and, and yeah, you're right. The mind is tricky. Dharma thoughts can be very, very tricky. You can think, oh, I'm not really thinking. I'm thinking about the Dharma. I'm thinking about how, you know, I'm, I'm, think, I'm in awareness. Isn't this wonderful? Isn't aware this is weird. And really what you're doing is having Dharma thoughts. <laughs> but you're, you're allowing them because you think, well, if it's Dharma thoughts, it's not really thinking. <laughs> Um, but it's still thinking. But that thought, that so the first thing you said, you were just in awareness. Awareness is not thinking. You're just holding it in awareness. The th second thing you said, oh, aren't I good? I caught my thought. That's simply another thought. And you just notice that. Thank you. I think I might get it. <laughs> Keep it, I just want to say one more thing. Keep it simple. Keep it real simple. Noticing what's happening. Be very, you can be very relaxed in it. Just re resting in that awareness, noticing what's arising into awareness. Noticing when you're no longer present in awareness, when you're pulled away, and then just simply coming back to that still context within which it all, all the movement happens. You're just noticing all this movement, yeah. Sorry, would it be safe to say then, for me, I need a paradigm here, um, that then awareness is a more physical thing? Um, Hmm. Um, I wouldn't say it's physical. Uh, I, I would say that <clears throat> the body can be helpful in bringing us to the present moment, which is where awareness resides, because the body is, is more grounded than the mind. So the body can be helpful in, in, ground, in you know, bringing us into the present moment, but it doesn't mean that awareness is, it's, it's mind and body, it's kind of permeates everything. It's, a, it's everywhere. It's not more physical or, or more not physical. I mean, I'm getting a bit, I would again, we'll go back to keeping it simple uh, it sounds like you might have a lot of Dharma thoughts too. Um, and just you know, go back to simplicity and just noticing what's arising moment by moment. There's thought. You might want to little, put a little note on it. There's planning. There's worrying. Worry, but then come right back to awareness or to your object, whatever it might be. So you put a little little label on it, which... And it just puts it at just light touch. And then just, and it doesn't matter what the label is, just a little light touch. It's, you've seen it and it, 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 it dissolves back to awareness. Yeah. I try to use doing the dishes as a form of meditation and I, and, uh, or vacuuming. And I find that uh, like the doing, like just just doing, and trying to like do the dishes, and and and, I, and I'll I'll find that in the process of doing the dishes or vacuuming, that my mind will wander into thoughts, and I realize that my thoughts have taken me away from my concentration on just doing the dishes. You know, concentrate on you know washing a fork or a spoon, and then you know putting it through the water, rinsing it and placing it properly. Because I notice when I when I when I start to get lost in thought, the doing the, the doing gets kind of disruptive and I'll 
I'll bump something or I'll, you know, so I'll notice it. Like, you know, but, it, but it's hard. I mean, I didn't realize how hard just doing the dishes or even vacuuming where I'll, I'll start getting pissed off. You know, and the thoughts that I'm getting pissed off about are uh, thoughts that I had when I was 10 years old and I was told to do the vacuum, right? And how, and those come up and I realized how, how, the, the, like what, a, what an absurd sort of thought to be getting into that's, you know, 40 years old, you know, it's so, it, it, so it brings me back to like the doing of the vacuuming as a as sort of a concentration practice, as a meditation practice. And it's hard. And I find how difficult that is. You know, just, just doing that. Um, because thoughts do invade, you know, just, just the simplicity of, 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 you know, And I'll say this, it's, it's so important. There's nothing wrong with thoughts arising. It's not a problem. If you think that's a, that your thoughts arising is a problem, and I'm not saying this particular to you, Carl, I'm saying it's kind of yeah. a general. If we think it's a problem, then it's our attitude that's the problem, not the thoughts arising. The, the, the attitude that this shouldn't be happening now. So, I mean, you're, you're using your, you know, vacuuming, dishwashing, walking are tremendous opportunities to practice this concentration practice because it gives you something visceral or re real to kind of focus ten like a sensation in the body around vacuuming you know, the shoulder moving. It can be anything or, or walking meditation. It's the sensation of the foot touching the ground, a dish dishwashing the water in the hands, just bring your attention to that. So that the, those are very uh, helpful practices. And it also helps us bring our meditation into our everyday life. Because again, the whole point of this is that we're aware throughout the day. This is where insight really starts to mushroom <laughs> or um, grow like a mushroom <laughs> it's uh it really starts to blossom is when we're um at that level of awareness throughout the day so when any anything arises that disturbs it's just seen and it's not a it's not even something then that we have to uh consciously do it just becomes our the habit. Um, this will, but the thoughts still come up. A thought about my feelings got hurt, or does this person like me, or whatever it might be. <laughs> that thought might could still, but it's just seen in that moment with that continuous awareness and bringing mindfulness or concentration into our daily activities helps bring that bring meditation and daily life together yeah. i think what what i what i get out of it as well is um is the awareness of knowing what how an activity triggers me you know like the the the, the doing the vacuum you know it, it, when i when i suddenly realized that oh i'm being I, I'm being triggered by this, almost like, you know, a little bit of like a Pavlovian, you know, dog thing having to do something. It sort of sort of freed me up to go back to it and just and be in the moment. So, uh, you know, and I do kind of piss, you know, you know, knock myself sometimes, but I, I was, it, was, it was a nice insight to kind of realize how I, how my, my thinking gets triggered into something as well. So it was able to kind of bring me back in the activity is you know, so that was it was a, it was a, it's a it's a constant but it's a it was helpful to kind of recognize those uh, those patterns you know through trying to be mindful and concentrate on something mm -hmm. you know I'm having a bit of trouble telling the three of them apart. 
Can you, can you describe the three kinds of concentration again? So, um, the, the one, the one pointed concentration is perhaps the easiest to uh, recognize in that your focus is just on one object for the duration of the meditation. Now one object most often in the West is the breath. Well, actually in the, in most places, the breath seems to be the one that's, it's always there. Um, so that's one pointed focused on one object. The more flexible you allow concentration, attention to be on whatever object appears. Kind of like the choiceless awareness, whatever arises with a sound, a thought, an emotion, that's what you focus on until it dissolves and then you would come back to the breath. You can kind of look at the breath as an anchor in that case. But the awareness goes out and is aware of moment, whatever arises in the moment. So you can see there's less control. There's still a sense of control there. Focused, it's, to, it's you know, you're controlling awareness, attention. This one, you're allowing objects to freely float and change, and, but you're but awareness is going to what other, whatever object um, is predominant in the foreground. Okay. Oh, natural awareness, you're simply concentrating on or focusing on awareness itself, that stillness, that quiet, that is always there, but is clouded. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. So next week we'll, um, next week we're, uh, so, a key part of this practice is um, is dealing with the hindrances. And somebody mentioned the hindrances. I can't remember who it was at this point uh, during a session. Um, raise your hand if you you really know. I already know a lot about the hindrances and how to deal with the hindrances. Okay, I'm gonna, well, that's what the next talk. Well, because part part of concentration practice is is knowing what to do with these these hindrances, and there's also fetters, these sense desires, aversion, sloth and torpor, or sleepiness, uh, restlessness, and doubt. When those five hindrances arise, they pull you away from the ability to concentrate attention. And part of concentration practices is whole, you know relating to the hindrances in, in particular ways. So I, th I thought perhaps I'd do another tangent, if you guys are open to that, talk about the hindrances, key, 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 key part of this practice, and then move on to equanimity uh, after that. How does, does that sound uh, feasible? Good stuff, yeah, awesome. Thanks everyone. Joy again to see you all. Thanks, Steve. Have a good Thank week. Next week. Thanks, Steve. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Be safe. Be safe. Bye. Bye.